Welcome to Founder Line, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you all with us. Founder Line is all about helping people with their startups. So you might be someone who's thinking about starting a company, or maybe you've already started the company and you're facing a situation that you need some help with. Maybe you're uh, an, a potential employee who's thinking about joining a startup and you want to ask a question about what's life like, or is this company doing well, or whatever it might be. In any of those situations, we want to see if we can help you today. Uh, this is a live show, and it only works if you ask us questions. We've gotten a number of questions already, but it's great if we get some more during the show. Uh, the best way to do that, two ways. One is to email us. Uh, the email address is help at founderline.com. And the second way is via Twitter. You can tweet at us. The handle is at founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Jason Lemkin, who's a managing director of Storm Ventures, where, excuse me, he focuses on early stage SaaS and enterprise startups. He's the founder of the Saster community for SaaS executives, and previously started two companies, uh, EchoSign, which was acquired by Adobe, and Nanogram, which was acquired as well. Uh, he's an investor in a bunch of SaaS leaders, including TalkDesk, Parklet, and Rainforest QA. Jason, welcome and thanks for joining us thanks today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. Great, great to have you here. Um, so before uh, before we dive in, um, let's spend a few minutes just talking about your background sure. as an entrepreneur and an investor. Um, uh, you know, you started a couple of companies. Yep. Um, Nanogram, which uh, uh, I guess was in the nanotech space. It was, right? yeah. And, and EchoSign as well, which uh, which more in the, in the digital media space. Um, so maybe talk about your experiences starting companies and growing them and eventually uh, helping them get acquired by larger companies. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, it, it's hard, right? Starting companies is friggin' hard, right? Yep. Um, and, um, you know, the, usually what I find is, you know, the first one people do, they, the, the reason they do it is they're just ignorant. They just don't know, right? So the, I started my first startup. Is that the case with you? Yeah, or? it was late 2002. The world had ended, right? There were no there were no companies anymore, okay. right? I mean, I mean... And what else are you going to do? Might as well start a company because otherwise we'll have no job. Yep. Um, so I grabbed the piece of technology from an R&D experiment that had failed. I grabbed the most junior engineer in our company that had led this little experiment, and we just started a company. We raised $9 million in venture capital and started our own company, right? Mm -hmm. Downside in end of 2002, the pre-money was two, so we raised nine on two. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and I had to sign a $750,000 full recourse promissory note along with the VC's money. Wow. And it was, for all the VCs in that company, it was the only deal they did the whole year. So very different times, right? Yeah. It makes no sense. I mean, why would you sign a, assign your house? Like, I gave away my house, my wife's car, everything, right? It makes wow. no sense, right? Wow. So anyhow, that was fun. So, so the company that bought us right before we raised the money, I begged them to buy us for $50,000, and they said no. And then 12 and a half months later, they had to pay $50 million. Wow. So it's not a unicorn, but it, that, that three orders of magnitude, that, that's pretty fun. But crazy, makes, makes no sense, right? So somebody made some good money on that. Yeah, it was all good. We, we made good money, but, but the, the nine on two was, was a little rough yeah. by, by current yeah. standards. That might be uh, the most ridiculous yeah. valuation I've ever heard. And then, you know, EchoSign, we built up to many, many tens of millions of dollars of business, but that first year is so hard, right? All the, the founder challenges, getting it off the ground, understanding what's traction, what matters, yeah. right? And it's just, um, you know, the funny thing is we thought that first year was terrible, like that we failed, we hadn't achieved anything. But now that I actually know how hard it is to build a recurring revenue business, I'm like, wow, we had like 10 Fortune 500 companies and we had thousands of customers we and, we were, great. and we had great partners. It took longer, it was harder. Um, but um, yeah, so anyhow, so what I digest that all is there's this Israeli startup saying that I can't find anywhere on Google, but, but I remember it was from like the mayor of Tel Aviv and it's zero to one million, like impossible because no one needs another like web service, another game, like zero to one million in revenue, impossible, right? right? One to 10, unlikely, right? It's just, it's too many people, too much work, but then 10 to 100, inevitable, hmm. right? So that I've learned in, in recurring revenue, like it turns that. out it's even more true because once you get to eight figures in revenue, 10, 15, 20 million in revenue, even if you never ship another feature, even if you piss off your customers, it'll take years and years and years to die, right? And you can find more customers in the You can always find later. more customers, right? So the real key is getting to inevitable, right? And so if nothing else, when I meet, I tried to invest with founders well before they're at a million in revenue, but if whatever you do at one, just get to 10. Hmm. Like don't screw around, 
don't like launch a new edition unless it's going to get you more revenue. Don't do a new cool this. Just put your head down and get to inevitable, and then it just all gets easier. And turn the crank, right? Turn the crank, yeah. Awesome. Well, so at, after you did EchoSign, yeah. I don't know, is that when you started Saster? Or? No, I had, a, I had a stint where I was a VP at Adobe, so I learned what okay. it was like to be a VP on the inside in the Fortune 500 with the corner office and the two admins, one for external meetings, one for internal meetings. Wow. And, and I learned, I did learn a lot about that, uh, you know, uh, uh, true enterprise performance reviews and actually, actually it's interesting, I've done a bunch of HR investments that I wouldn't have done if I hadn't have been a VP in the Fortune 500 dealing with HR drama, yeah. right? So, yeah. so a lot of, so I did that, um, took some time off um, and then became a VC. But interestingly, the real story of the community is when I was a VP at Adobe, um, and I was a corporate VP. There's like 40 and 16,000 people. So there are, there are social media limitations, which makes sense. You're representing a, right. a historic brand. Right. So if you want to tweet or if you want to blog or do any of these things, it needs to go through PR. And so I decided like a 30-day turnaround for a tweet was a little long. <laughs> so I got out the HR policy, and it was prescriptive. And it said what you couldn't do, but it hadn't been updated in years. So it said you can't Bebo, you can't MySpace, you can't GeoCities, you can't do all these things. But it didn't say you couldn't Quora. So I decided I'd sold for better or for worse, and I would just answer all the questions and tell everything that I screwed because up. Because of right? a loophole. That yeah, was, and I decided yeah. I have nothing left to hide. I don't have to pretend I know everything. Yeah, yeah. So it turned out today we crossed 1,300 SaaS answers on Quora. Wow. Right? So the blog's done well, and we get about a million views a month. But this Quora loophole was kind of the, the, the back door that created this community. Wow, that's awesome. And, that, yeah. and now that you're gone, obviously, you can do whatever you want. So you can have... The blog and yeah, I kept waiting. They would come to the corner office and say, "You know what? This Quora thing is not cool." We've updated but the policy. We yeah. call this the Jason rule, you right? You think I got called up to the HR's office several times, but it was never. It was just never about the Quora. Wow. Right? Yeah. Awesome. Well, so now um, you know doing investing at Storm Ventures, yes. and um, uh, you know I, I know for a lot of us who have been entrepreneurs who then cross over and start. Going into the investing side, you know, yeah. it's it's a different world, right? A different and, world. Um, I I love investors who have been entrepreneurs because you know what it's like sitting in that CEO chair and what it's like trying to raise money and maybe the metrics aren't there or whatever. So maybe maybe talk about that transition from you know being the entrepreneur to now being on the other side of the table and being yeah, the it is very, it's very it's certainly very interesting and sort of semi cathartic to founders. I've learned right. For first of all, let me step back. I'll tell you one learning. And let's talk about that. Of the third of three categories of VCs, you know, founder CEOs, they perform the worst, worst results. As VCs. Yeah, the worst nice. results. Now the VPs that were a VP at Twitter or whatever, they, they, do, they can do quite well. Huh. But the CEOs, uh, they tend to be rash, they tend to have trouble in partnerships, they tend to cycle out quickly, they don't have the top returns, right? And so what I learned is that founder CEO, if you're an entrepreneur, that's the VC you want. You want someone that's been through it with right, you. Right? Right. You don't want the guy in the suede loafers like calling you from the from the country club, telling you how to run your company. He doesn't know what he's yeah. You don't want that dude, yeah, right? Yeah. But from an LP perspective, and LPs are the folks that invest in VCs, not so clear that the CEO is really <laughs> is really who you want. The data, uh, you know, Andreessen Horowitz perhaps over time an exception, but still a, an interesting firm. But data suggests it's, it's not necessarily the winner. Um, Anyhow, so that's just an interesting uh, So uh, the deck's stacked against you. The deck, uh, deck is stacked against you a little bit. Um, I mean, it's not like an order of magnitude difference, but the results are, are, are materially worse. Um, so yeah, so the biggest, so first of all, um, you know, it is a big difference. As a CEO, you make the decisions, but it's, and, but it's collaborative, right? So you get together your management team or your co-founders, you talk it through, and right. then at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. Right. You know, VC is totally opposite, right? Um, you don't. You have a partnership, so decisions are, are are sort of joint and several, or whatever the right legal term is, right? And it's sort of semi-collaborative. But actually, you're out. You're each game hunters. You're each out there sourcing, managing, closing yep. your own deals, and yep. you're a bunch of game hunters to get together for a few hours on Monday and talk about your shared, right? So you're, it's kind of a. It's kind of like I learned that VC is kind of like a. And I may have this wrong, but I think it's like a gymnastics team going for medals in the Olympics, right? There's like shared medals, like we all want the gold, yeah. but it's kind of an individual sport. You high five each other when you get off the bounce. You do, you high five. And the, and the LP certainly, who are the folks that invest in VCs, they judge you very individually, right? And, and the real learning, the other thing that's interesting is from the LP perspective, you're just a number. You're a piece of meat. What are your results? How long are they proven, right? The, and so it's it's very interesting as someone who at least you have some success as a founder or CEO and everything's about the team, it's about the company. 
And then at least for the first 12 months I was at VC, like the LPs just looked through me like cellophane. Hmm. They're like, because I didn't have a track record yet. You right? had no IRR. Yeah, right? so, well, okay, so you made five or six X twice as a founder. We don't care. What's your, what, have, what cash on cash have you as a professional invest? And that's a fair point, right? So uh, I haven't returned a nickel yet, but I have some pretty good markups now. So at least there's, there's indicators of possible success. I but, see. Um, but anyhow, that's just sort of fun. And so, you know, you, the Uber learning is whatever you're doing in life, when it's new, you always have to prove yourself, no matter how much success you, <laughs> you had before. And it is, it is interesting. Um, but the, I think the biggest challenge is that is going from that hyper collaborative environment as a founder, right? Yeah. Startups are s so much harder than being a VC. I mean, 10 times harder, right? But it's like, you know, it's like LeBron James and the Cavaliers. I mean, you're, every night at least you're going into yep. battle together, right? And, and there's and another game tomorrow. That's right? another game. And, and, and actually, more than that, I realized, you know, having done two startups with at least some success, looking back on it, the only thing that you really take with you is the team, the relationships, right. the journey, right. the mistakes, the successes, even the product. I don't who cares about the product. Who, I mean, it's just there's, there's a million products in the world, right? Yeah. And so it's that, it's that journey and then, um, uh, but the flip side of the VC is once, here's the thing that's the one thing that's been really fun about the VC is um, seeing some of your founders eclipse you. It's like, your, it's not like your kids, it's not your company, right. but seeing some folks that you invest in very early even in just 18 months, eclipse anything you've accomplished, there's no ego, that's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. what it's all about. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, the, you know, that's one of the challenges I find in angel investing is it's kind of a lonely existence. You know, yes. you're kind of on your own, and uh, you know, I, I find that I miss that collaborative environment of working with your team, even, even when you're struggling and like going through tough times, like part of that in a sick sort of way is fun, right? Like you're you're tackling a challenge of some sort. It is sort. fun. It's at least hyper engaging. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's engaging. Yeah. Right? So it sucks at times. But um, but yeah, that, so I actually find with angel investing, I try to do it with others and, and sort of, you know, loose confederation yeah. uh, where, where you at least, you know, maybe engage with another investor and look at stuff together or, or bounce some ideas or whatever um, just because you can't replace that sort of team dynamic. Uh, and, I, and, and you know, I imagine in a firm it's probably a little better because you guys are getting together and you, you know, you're you're working as as a under one roof trying to accomplish Absolutely. something. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's that's the hardest part about angel investing, I think, is is doing it alone. So um, well, anyway, uh, great great intro, and um, why don't we dive in and uh, see if we can help some people out? So. Sure. Um, Let's, um, let's go to our first question. Uh, this one, there was no name attached. Uh, how can Zenefits possibly be worth $4 billion after just two years? For those who don't know, if you've been living under a rock, uh, hypergrowth company out of YC, I believe. Yep. And uh, just, I, I mean, it literally is two years old from when they first started, and it's, it's going like gangbusters. So how, how does that happen? How does it become worth $4 billion so quickly? Well, it is, you know, uh, you know, I, and I, uh, the, the shocking part isn't that it's worth four and a half billion. The, the shocking part has happened in two years in something that's a, that's a product you actually have to sell. Zenefits itself is actually free, but it is a sold sold product, right? right? right. So we're we're sort of accustomed to Snapchats. Like you turn around and I don't I don't understand Snapchat, but why is it worth why did it worth a billion and then it's sixteen? Like we kind of get that that you see this exponential growth at least of users, but exponential growth of revenue like it, it doesn't happen, yep. right? So. We could talk about a lot of things, but what's interest the real thing that's interesting about Zenefits, and then it, it informs the question, is that the the trend of SASification is accelerating. We're in the second, maybe early third inning. And what that means is the best SaaS companies are growing faster than ever, mm -hmm. right? If I look at a, like a little cohort at Storm, you know, EchoSign 05, like Marketo, a great Storm investment. Marketo grew twice as fast as, as EchoSign. And I invest in a company called TalkDesk that'll do 1 to 12 in 12 months. That's that's again twice as fast as Marketo, right? And and is it is it that the founders were better? Well, uh, certainly Phil and Tiago are better CEOs than me. But but some of that is just this acceleration in the markets, right? And so just the acceptance of SaaS as just a, everything's faster, yeah, right? Yeah. And so Zen, if Zenefits really does one to a hundred million in twenty four months, which is the plan, they did one to twenty last year. Wow. Then yes, even the valuation even for this year is difficult to understand. But if that hundred continues at that rate. Then they're then they're the where the business is at the end of 2017. Kind of if you're leaning forward a year and a half, and everyone's leaning mm -hmm. forward in this market, it's not preposterous, right? If it's doing 300 million at the end of the following year, times 4.5 for a company accelerating at that rate, uh, 
It it's is. not, it's not, it's not, no one's, here's the learning of the, of all this crazy stuff in the unicorns today. Yeah. You can be cynical, but no one's dumb. Everyone has a playbook that they're executing against, right? They know what they're doing, right? Yeah. They may lose money, <laughs> right? But no one's investing in the globe, right? Well, and that, like, to me, that's an amazing story, right? Those guys, uh, I mean, is, is that the fastest growing SaaS company ever? You know, it, quite possibly, right? Yeah, I think um, it might be. It quite possibly. And whether, and the critics will say Zenefits isn't a SaaS company, it's free, it's an insurance broker, it's different. And uh, who cares, right? I mean, it's 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 recurring revenue. I can I consider it SaaS, right? Yeah, and and yeah. an amazing an amazing team. One of the, you know I met the CEO when they were maybe at 5K a month in revenue. One of the best CEOs I've ever met, even at that stage. Great, wow. amazing VP of sales and revenue team. Amazing team. So that that's key. But but I don't know that uh, I don't know that I mean two or three years ago Zenovitz could not have grown at that rate. The, the markets is f there's different markets. In this case, sort of SMBs are late to SaaS. Right, yeah. it's just a fact. And what Zenefits is really doing, it's doing a lot of things, but it's really taking, instead of someone calling up their broker and getting them to do all the work, you're, they're actually getting people to do the work themselves. Yeah. Um, and just a couple of years ago, I don't think most SMBs are willing to do that. Clearly we've reached a tipping point where thousands and thousands of small businesses are willing to do the work, right? Yeah. And create their own mini HIRS system on their own. And um, that's, so, so sign of the times, right? Um, you know, having said that, you know, the fact that NASDAQ has almost quadrupled in four years clearly contributes to the valuations yeah, yeah. that we see. Well, awesome for the, for the market and, uh, you know. Yeah, and a great, great team, great yeah, company. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, all right, well, uh, Anonymous, uh, thanks for the question. Let's, um, let's move on. This one is from Preston. It says, uh, first time caller, long time listener. So Preston, thank you for uh, tuning in occasionally. Um, Jason, you often talk about tilting up market yep. once you have a couple of larger enterprise use cases. In your experience, is there a good systematic approach that your product dev team should take in determining how the product needs to evolve to match the needs of the larger enterprise? Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. Because I don't know this uh, let, tilting up. Let me kind of uh, simplify it. I think, I think yeah. what the question is, so it's early. Um, and you get a couple big customers, one or two, a couple whales. You know, okay. your, your products typically sells like me. You know, my, when I launched, actually, when I launched the product, not only was it free, but we didn't even have a payment page. Ignore that for the moment. <laughs> but maybe, maybe four months in, the average customer was paying ninety-nine dollars a month. And then we get, we got Dell, uh, G, Brooks Eckert Pharmacy, BT, a bunch of others, all who paid between fifty and hundred thousand. So how do you go from ninety-nine dollars a month to fifty and hundred thousand, right? Okay. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know that there's a magic answer, but but here's the one thing I can distill it down to. One that happens sometimes, and it's happened with other companies, where it can create internal chaos. A lot of folks, because the thing is, um, the bigger the customer, um, the more they kind of complain and ask for stuff. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and and the closer you are to a freemium cust customer, is more closer to consumer, and you just ignore what they complain about, right? I mean, if seven people at Dropbox don't like the interstitial message, I mean, how many people use Dropbox? You just <laughs> got to ignore them, right, right? Right. But when Dell says or Google says, "I need this," you may say no, but you can't ignore it. And and so that's really the biggest part of the culture. Because as founders, usually when we sell the businesses, we jump on a landmine, right? When someone comes in, we know whether this is a waste of my time or good use of my time. Yeah. And w but how do you drag the company there, right? And I don't know, it's cultural, but here's the one thing, if you, if you tell your company this, that they'll buy into. Everyone struggles when they get that first one, that, fir that changes, that, that big enterprise customer. Tell them this, because then they'll know it's true. If you get one, you know you can get two. Hmm. Is, is, is Dell really the only company on the face of the earth that will pay $50,000 a year for your product? Of course, of course you can get another, right? right? right. Of course you can get another, right? Um, so tell them that it may feel like an outlier and it may feel like a lot of work today and it may feel no, it may have totally changed your product roadmap and you may need disaster recovery and, 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 and HIPAA compliance and all these terrible, painful things to do. But don't think of it as a one-off or a tax. Think of it as the future. Hmm. It's the future. So that first big customer you get is the future, right? And, um, and I, I invested in this company a year ago called Algolia that does search as a service. Um, uh, and it was doing about 5K a month in revenue. Um, now it's doing several million in AR in 12 months. And I just, I was just doing this presentation with the CEO and when I invested, they had one customer that was paying five figures. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I said to him, well, you, you'll have 20. <laughs> and he said, I didn't believe, you told me that I didn't believe it, but of course they do, right? If, if some little product uh, shipped out of Paris being used by a US technology company, you get one 20K customer, of course you can get 10. So if you tell your company that, they'll internalize it and then they'll change 
and they'll say this is the future, not an outlier, right? Because no one wants to do work for an outlier, yep. right? Yep. No one wants to do one-off work. No engineer wants to do one-off work, no, right? I know, I know. And, and it's, many times there's stuff you want to do that you know you got to get to, but you know, it's, it's on the roadmap. It's, it's the like, roadmap. we'll get to it later. And then a big enterprise customer comes along and says, hey, this is killing us, right? We need the we need whatever. It. And, and so then maybe you just shift priorities you a shift little bit priorities. And, and get it. Uh, but if you tell them that it's the future, not a tax, it's true. Yeah. And then you, the team will rally around you. That's yeah. what you have to explain to them, right? Well, I, I, hope, uh, I hope that answers your quest question, Preston. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's a great question. Um, so let's, um, let's move on. We've got one here from uh, Mikey in New York. Hello, Mikey. Uh, while founders would love to hire only A-plus players, yes. it's a tough market. So that's often easier said than done. What are some underrated characteristics and potential hires that you should consider when you can't hire the perfect candidate? Yes. Um, so hiring, you know, one of the biggest challenges of any startup, right? It's hard, right? So well, let's flip it around, okay? What, what can you not compromise on, right? You can't hire someone that can't do the job, right? You just, you just can't, yep. right? And, and I, I've written, one of the most popular things I've ever written about is how 70% of your first VPs of sales don't work out. Hmm. Okay, it, I, that, that, I made the number up based on a non-scientific survey, but it's about right as I keep adding wow. to the list, okay? And why? Well, typically that first VP of sales, they actually look good on paper. They were a VP of sales at some other company, yep. and, and they often they're kind of tall and trim and talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk, yep. right? So don't sacrifice resume for capabilities. That's, that's what we, especially when we haven't done it ourselves, right? It's one thing when you've done it before. If you come out of product and you had a great VP of product as a boss, you know what a great VP of product is. The exactly. mistake we tend to make is when we hire in the domains that we haven't managed before, sales, marketing, product engineer, whatever we have, don't, we hire the resume and the talking up rather than the skills, yeah. right? So if I could distill it all down, sacrifice the resume, sacrifice the great names for someone that has clearly done at least a piece of it right? Yep. Um, and the way I boil it down to it is, if it's a manager, maybe someone that's hired and scaled two people. Like maybe my VP of sales only got two reps successful. Mm. Zero. If they've never hired a rep, the main job of a VP of sales is recruiting. So if they've never recruited, can you make that risk? Yeah. No. Yeah. Can I risk the guy that hired two great reps will hire 20 or 100? Yeah, I'll take that risk if it's tough, right? Yeah. VP of engineering, what's your number one job when you're at scale recruiting? and managing the recruits. Exactly. Do not hire a CTO to be your VP of engineering. Do not hire an architect or someone that wants to manage a couple of friends. Don't, no matter how smart she is, it's not going to work, right? What, what do you do with the killer salesperson who maybe isn't the best manager yeah. or recruiter? I mean, how, how do you, you ever come across that situation where you know you want them like yes. out beating the bushes, but you know they, they feel like, oh, I gotta step up and take the next level in my career or whatever. Yeah, the thing is that, uh, so it's, it, it happens a lot. I find that it resolves itself, okay? Because there's, there's two types of those folks that they go from a successful individual contributor sales rep. Yeah. Often making, and successful if you're an individual contributor has to mean big money, okay? Like now, what, 400K, whatever, 500K? Whatever it is, whether it's 500K to big company or 250K, to, it just has to be top, top of the pyramid, yeah. okay? More than anybody else in the company. More than anybody else in the company, yeah. right? Um, and then they want to be they want to be that VP for one of two reasons, right? One is they truly want to do this as a career. They get it, and they worked for a great VP, right? And the other one is they it's just some sort of ego thing on its own, right? And the, you can tell pretty quickly the ones that are willing to step down. There's no issue around cash or comp or anything because yeah. they know, right? It's the it's the it's the blackjack dealer issue, right? I forget what it is, but in Vegas, if you're doing the high end table, you make far more money as tips than the guy that manages them, right? right? And that's going to happen for a great VP of sales, right? right. My, so talk about Zenefits. One of my, one of our best directors of sales is now VP of sales at Zenefits, killing it, right? Killing it. He he hired a hundred sales reps last year in his first year on the job. Wow, amazing! And and he was our best SDR, and then he was our most successful enterprise sales rep, and then most successful sales manager, most successful everything, right? And when he transitioned under me from an individual contributor to a manager, he took he took fifty percent salary cut, not because we asked him to, but it was the nature of the beast. Did yeah. he complain for one minute, one hour, nothing? He knew that his eye was on 
the VP of sales job. prize, right? Yeah. And so I'm not saying money matters to sales guys. You, the, do not hire a VP of sales that says it's not about the money, <laughs> that it's about the teamwork. Do yeah. not hire any salesperson that says it's not about the money. That's not, a, it might be a biz dev person, right? It might be a great, but it's not a salesperson. But if this person wants to become the VP of sales at Zenefits and have a bunch of equity in something worth $4.5 billion, maybe I got to sacrifice 20 or 50 grand this year, or maybe yeah. even more for Sam, yeah. right? That's how you know. And, and what I found is these guys that don't really want it, they won't make the sacrifices, because they don't see it. Hmm. They're like, you know, I can't take the this, I can't do that, and it's just, then you know it's not gonna get there, right? So look for making the right sacrifice to get to the top of the next pyramid. Got it. Great, well, uh, I hope that answers it. Um, there, there's, while we're on the subject of VP of sales, there's a question from Susan about VP of sales. So yep. we're trying to hire a, a VP of sales for our early stage SaaS company. We've got six early customers and are growing. Yes. Uh, it doesn't say how big or anything. Um, yep. What's the best way to find a world-class VP of sales? Hire a recruiter, LinkedIn, other. So, yep. so how, first, how wait. You find? Oh, wait. Six is way too early. Okay. Do not hire a VP of sales until you've hired yourself two sales reps that hit quota that perform. So oh. the CEO's managing Has to manage two, two sales reps. Doesn't the need CEO's to be three. probably doing a lot of sales to begin with, right? Hopefully. Get two reps that are successful. You don't need three or four. Until you have two, you have not built a repeatable process and you don't know what the hell you're doing. Okay. You just don't. Can you really hire someone? You're going to end up hiring the six foot four paratrooper that talks up and talks about ARR and MRR and runs your company into the friggin' ground. Okay. You've got, I know it's hard. Right? It's, if we haven't done sales. But this is all hard, as we talked about. Absolutely. Startups are, so go make, not only close some companies, customers yourself, get two reps to hit quota, 200K a year. Six customers, I don't know what your deal size is, it ain't enough, right? So that's the real answer, right? Um, and, then, and then once you've done that, which is it's gonna take her six to 12 months to get there, what's the best way to source? Everything, right? Use your network, pay recruiters, right? Do, do whatever it takes. But here's the, here's the real insight, let's step back. Even though she may be nine months away from the hire, if you really wanna hit it, you have to make the hire today, start making the hire today. Hmm. And why is this, right? So let's think about different roles. Let's say you wanna hire a VP of engineering, and they're gonna go from like boring startup to just IPO'd, to, you know, you're gonna recruit someone out of New Relic or Box, it got boring for them, they, right? Yep. They'll come to your company because it's an equity to equity thing. Okay, I'll get 1% of your company as VP of engineering. I had 0.3 there, and it's just equity to equity, yep. right? Yep. Cash is not the main driver for this role. Imagine you're the VP of sales, and you're at, say, say you're at Ignite across the street, and you're the, I'm just making it up. And not only do you have, say, a percent of the company, but you're making five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars of VP of sales. I'm gonna go to your company, and I'm gonna get the same amount of equity, but unvested. And I'm, are you gonna pay me 600 grand to right, join? Right. Of course, even if I give you, uh, an OTE of $500,000, that's not guaranteed. I'm gonna give you a base of 120, and you've gotta go all the way back up that curve to get up to 500, and you have to recruit all the people again yep. and go through that whole thing. So if you walk across the street to Ignite and you lure their VP of sales out today, you, it's not a guy you want. Not yeah. always, but think about it, right? So mm. it, it's a courtship process. And that guy, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just having fun with Ignite because they're literally across the street. Yeah. Whatever that company is, Oftentimes with the great ones, um, unless there's a situational thing, like an acquisition, like that's a great time to, to poach people, yeah, right? Yeah. But if you want to pull someone out, it, a great VP sales may need to sniff the tires, learn, get comfortable for months. So start now and, and top, meet as many as you can and just tell them you want to make the hire in Q3 and or Q4. And they'll kind of watch the data they'll points. They'll watch like, the data points. Oh, it looks like it's picking up. Yeah. All right, I can get on this boat as it's you know, starting to take off or yeah. whatever the right metaphor The is. great ones in many ways are conservative. Right, because they're loot, they may risk a lot, money and team. And, and the, what you learn with great sales teams, and great sales teams, there's no attrition. Great sales teams stay together. They make a ton of money together. They, they go fun. into battle together. Yeah. They have fun, right? And so why would you want to leave your team? And you can what? never pull your whole team out to another company. It's, it's just, just, What about right? time of year? Like, like does, does end of year bonuses come into this? Like, well, I'm, I'm interested, Only at big companies. Okay. And then they'll just wait till February 28th. Yeah. They'll tell you. <laughs> They'll start working with you in November, like on the side, and then. Yeah. I just recruited for one of my companies a VP of marketing out of a big public SaaS company, and you know they shook hands in December, and he started you know March first. It's just, it's, the way it's it okay. <laughs> Got it. Well, I, some great advice, Susan. I, I hope that uh, that helps. I, I love the you know w in this case waiting is the right answer, right? Yes. And, um, Especially as hard as it is, yeah, right. Yeah. And, it, and unless unless you have no other choice, unless you're truly just 
have the world's best product truly, and you're just incompetent at sales, then break the rule. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, hope that helps. Let's do. Um, we'll do one more before uh, we go to commercials. So. Um, this one is from Robert. Uh, it says, do you have any advice for SaaS companies that are outside of the SFSV vortex, I guess yeah. that's Silicon Valley, uh, trying to get traction and raise money in a NorCal-centric startup environment? So I don't know where they are, but... Um, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know if, uh, Joel, maybe you, uh, if you have a, a city or something that might help, but, it, but I'm guessing not, otherwise he would have put it on there. So, so it's, I've learned a lot. So I, I mean, I've invested in, I've only done so many investments, but I've invested in companies from Paris, uh, France, from Estonia, from Portugal, uh, oh, from the UK. I'm here in Florida. So Florida. He's from Florida. Yeah. Um, Atlanta, right? And so, so let's step back for a minute. First of all, to be clear, there are a lot of people that will just want to invest in, in SaaS. They just, they just like, it's too hard. Too uh, far away. Yeah, so uh, I'd say SaaS VCs, half of them just will pass, and that's life, okay? So um, then here's, but here's my view, right, having done it, right? I view this as a little bit more nuanced. Um, the smaller the customer and the more transactional the product, the easier it is to do outside of the barrier. If I'm selling something for 400 bucks a month from a bunch of inbound leads, I can hire kids from any good college that is in any major metro area, there's always a good school where I can hire a bunch of kids that just can sell. Yep. Right? They, they, and, you can, and kids are, and they're great, right? I can hire young SDRs and I can hire folks to do transactional sales. The more enterprise you get, selling business process changing, complex solutions, you don't learn that in, you don't, you don't, you don't learn that at Florida, University of Miami, right. In Miami, right? right? And so that gets harder and harder outside of the barrier. And then eventually you find like a couple of guys, but then the real problem is management. There is no management. Hmm. I've invested in companies in New York uh, and, and Atlanta, we talked about, and others, and, and finding those VPs is basically impossible. For any role, like engineering, marketing? For en more enterprisey stuff. Okay. Right, and for marketing. For, for marketing and sa on the sales and customer success, it's when it gets more enterprise, there just isn't the bench outside of the barrier, Got right? It. And, it, and it's certainly true sometimes in engineering too, right? Although what I find is, you don't know, like at Algolia, which is in Paris, like it's one of the hottest startups in France, in Paris, and they've managed to recruit some of the very best talent. And they just, they, they, it's like flies them off. So if they were here, they'd have to compete with, you know, 10,000 Airbnb and Dropod, right. whoever, New Relic, whatever. There they, you know, so I'm not sure that I had, I think you can scale engineering in many ways, but it's that senior revenue talent that it just, it's, it's tough. And so I get nervous when people, have six-figure deals, 100K plus contracts, and they're based in, in outside of the barrier. It's tough, yep. right? And I also find that, and here's the other reason it's hard. So that's empirically true as a SaaS guy. The other thing that makes it hard for funding is um, not only is there sort of the VC ad value laziness, can't, can't drive the Maybach to, uh, to, to your office factor, <laughs> but it's worse now. It's actually worse the last two years, Speaking and I'll tell you personally. why. Yeah, it's, it's worse because more and more of the best entrepreneurs just come here. They just come, right? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons San Francisco is exploding is because all these people are from outside of the Bay Area. It's not that it's not Stanford kids that are making San Francisco blow up. It's not right. Stanford and Berkeley. Right. It's everyone from right. from all across the world, in the United States. And so, I, I will say this: I, I've, I've invested in many companies outside of the Bay Area. But when I meet with the founder and their reason for not moving to the Bay Area doesn't make like incredibly good sense, I'm pretty sure they're not going for it. Hmm. So as an angel, maybe it's okay. But yeah. as someone who's got to try at least try to get a unicorn. If, if your reason is lifestyle or, or the kids or the house, like I totally get that. I got kids, you got kids, I got a house. Like I, I empathize as a human being, but as a VC, if you're not going for it, then you know, just, just go. Just go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just good luck. So I'm not saying move, but have a great, you, and so, uh, or another version of that is to raise venture money outside of the Bay Area when you're selling to enterprise, you have to get further. Hmm. You get to six or seven million in revenue, You've got the magic. No okay. one, no one cares how you got whether you got it done from Tallahassee or, or Charlottesville. They just don't care, got right? It. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if that helps, Robert. But uh, I mean, it's that's always a tough situation. It's and, tough, uh, and it's not easier. It's harder. Now. And it sounds like you're willing to invest anywhere if yes. you find the right situation, right? So, yes. Uh, you get to take those free trips to Paris. But the bar is uh, just higher. Yeah. The bar, the bar's higher, right? Yeah, and it's already a high sense. bar. Right. All right. Well. Um, Great questions so far. Keep them coming. Uh, you can reach us via email. Uh, it's help at founderline.com. And you can also tweet to at founderline, and we'll see if we can help you out. But now um, we need to take a minute to thank our sponsors. 
Um, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do this show without the amazing support we get from our sponsors. Um, uh, those sponsors are Oric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. So uh, let's start with Oric. Um, I want to thank Mitch Zukli, and actually Mitch was your lawyer at EchoSign, right? For, so but through thick and thin. Yes. Yeah. So uh, so Mitch, Mitch is a great guy, and uh, you know worked with him on multiple companies. And I always tell people when they're getting started with a company, um, many times they've never hired a lawyer before, and of course you want somebody who can can do the basic legal paperwork and incorporation and stock option agreements and all that sort of stuff. Um, but more importantly, your lawyer is one of your most critical advisors. They have seen way more um, acquisitions, hirings, firings, you know, any legal transaction, they've seen thousands of them probably. And, uh, and as, if you're just starting out, you know, you've, you've probably seen zero. So, uh, and even if you worked at a few companies, you may not have been on the executive team and may not have even been involved in those things. So get somebody who can offer you great advice, who can say, you know, uh, and I, I remember conversations with Mitch where it's like, you know, Joe, that's just not really standard. I know you want to do X, but that's crazy. No one's ever going to go for that. Um, they're going to think you're nuts. So why don't you do Y? And, and that sort of um, advice is invaluable. Um, you can go and check out Oric at their website. It's uh, oric.com, and uh, I'm sure they're, uh, they'll be willing to help you out. Um, next, I'd like to thank our new sponsor for this season, Square One Bank. And... Uh, I've been working with uh, Sam, uh, Sam Bomick and Lori lamenti Gardi over there for a number of years on multiple companies. Um, wh when you're, again, when you're starting out, you want to have a bank who's obviously going to keep your money safe, but you want someone who's going to make your life easier and take care of really basic stuff, you know, online banking that your finance team can work with. Um, maybe you've been putting stuff on your personal credit card might make sense to get a corporate credit card which they can help you out with so you don't have personal uh, liability perhaps a little bit further down the road so um, uh, you know make sure you get somebody who's going to do a good job for you who's worked with startups before they know sort of the ups and downs and they aren't going to freak out if if you know something uh, uh, something weird happens uh, you can find out more about them also at their website uh, it is squareonebank.com it's square with the number one bank.com. Um, we have another new sponsor, which is Accretive Solutions. And um, uh, the person I've worked with there as my uh, interim CFO is uh, Martini Niganel, and she's, she's been great. Um, you, you know, I had to ask them, they're the leading business outsourcing firm in Silicon Valley, and I had to say, well, what is business outsourcing? Well, it, it's all of your, uh, your finance function. So it's uh, making sure payroll gets done, your accounts receivable, your accounts payable, um, getting board packages together, financial planning, whatever it is you need. Um, it, it, just as we were talking about, don't hire your, your VP of sales too early. You definitely don't want to hire your CFO and your finance team too early. So um, get somebody who can do it part-time for you, very reasonably priced, who again does this with tens or hundreds of companies at once. and. Um, can take care of all the basics so that you can focus on hiring and figuring out your product and why aren't you at product market fit and all those sorts of things that are really um, you know the cornerstone of your business and and find someone you trust to take care of sort of the basic blocking and tackling um, and a creative solutions uh, is is great at that so you can um, find out more at their website it is as-bos.com and uh, Martini can, uh, can definitely help you out. Um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, the team over at Ustream. When we first started this adventure last year, um, uh, Brad Hunstable and his team uh, said, you know, we'd love to support this and, and make sure that you guys have the best uh, that, that money can buy. And so um, we've been working with Warren and the rest of the team over there to use Ustream to bring these shows to you every week. And uh, if you're a company that uh, maybe you have remote offices where you need to do some streaming or you're ho holding some corporate events where you want to, um, you know, broadcast, uh, Ustream can definitely help you out with that. Their streaming technology is the best. They have great software that you can use to even do the switching between multiple cameras. Whatever you might need, um, you should be able to find it, uh, find it with Ustream. Um, again, uh, their website is easy to find. It's ustream.tv. 
So that is paying the bills, as they say in the business. Yep, they're great and, sponsors. Uh, yeah, no, we, we've been uh, we've been very lucky, and thanks thanks to all of them for uh, helping us out. We are uh, we're about 40 minutes in, so we've got about 20 minutes for some more questions. So let's uh, let's dive back in. Um, here's one from Andrew, and this one says we are an early stage SaaS company with 1.3 million raised and about 8K per month in recurring revenue. Yep. What expectations should we have about valuation at our Series A in a few months? What metrics should we be focusing on to make the most of our next round of financing? So yep. this, this sounds like a company that you might see pretty regularly, like yep. this, this sort of stage, right? So I guess my answer is don't have any particular expectations because while as a founder, 8K a month in revenue is amazing, right? 8K a month proves that's, that with the 10 billion applications out there in the world, some real, a real group of customers are actually willing to pay for you. You've done, the, you've done something magical. Like, so as a founder, you've done something amazing, right? Yeah. You, you, you've a uh, product market fit. Actually, in today's world, we talked about how companies like TalkDesk and Zenefits are growing faster than ever, but it actually means product market fit's harder because there's so much more competition, hmm. right? Back in 05, 06, you could throw up a SaaS app and there was nothing else out there. <laughs> so the markets were tiny, but you could you could penetrate, right? Today, you know, we talked about Zenefits, but there's like 200 vendors that do the same thing that Zenefits does, right? So if you and I do Zenefits Prime tomorrow, we're just, it's just, it's like the yeah. odds are against us, yeah. right? So what I mean is, so it's 8K means you have something and, and, and you should keep going no matter, I'm sure they're doing well, but no matter what it, no matter what it tells you, don't quit, right? Hmm. Don't, don't quit. Having said that, as a VC now, I give you no credit. So until, <laughs> why is that? Until, and I'm early stage, but until you have about 20 or 30K a month, it's not enough. Okay. I can't draw a dotted line, even optimistically, There'll be exceptions. We talked about Algolia. I invested Algolia at eight or 10K a month I met, um, and now it's doing millions. But I didn't give the revenue any real credit, right? All the revenue tells me at that level is that the product's sellable, hmm. right? But not that it, but it, that just, but it's not repeating yet. So, right? why, so why in that case did you decide, you know, you didn't need the 20 or 30K a month? Just the product idea was great? Great, or? great founders. Um, and I knew enough from that revenue that I could hope and pray that it would go the way I believed it would. Yep. Um, and and I, it was a, solving a problem, hosted search, which I'd lost a lot of hair on as a founder. So I, I had a false sense of comfort from domain expertise, which VCs always have false comfort from domain <laughs> expertise. I've done, that's true of all my investments. Um, but, so, but, but the question was valuation expectations. Yep. So, if I met you, you would certainly wouldn't count as a pre-revenue company. I'd give you full credit for having some, you get what, what you count as, you have something interesting. But valuation, if you want to step up, come back at 20 or 30 for a small step Got up. It. And if you want a big step up, come back at 80 or 100. So my real advice, the question behind the question is if you're not out of money, kick the can, wait. I see. Raise money in three to six months, I'll pay more. I'm not, I, I can't overpay, I have a $180 million fund, I'm not XL or Andreessen, but I'm not like, I'm willing to pay, what, if I can afford it, whatever is appropriate for your stage, sell less, raise more, wait. Right? Which, which isn't always an option if he's running out of cash, yeah, right? So yeah, but you know what, they have these wonderful things like AngelList and, and Safe Notes, just like- Maybe raise another 500K. Raise another 500K off, off wherever. You know, back when we got started, like you had to go to VCs for everything. Yep. Now VCs are just one source of capital. Now, if you're burning 10 million this year, your options are limited, right? But these guys, I say, go to AngelList first, right? Kick the can down the road or go back to your angels. Ask them for another 500K, right? Find a way. And then uh, on the metrics, so is it is it monthly, you know, revenue? Is that the number that matters to you most? Is that is monthly that... recurring revenue? That's okay. what people are looking for, okay. right? And when you get to 80 or 100 a month, you clear. That's what I call initial traction. Okay. You have something, and the debate is is what level the curve's going. So right? 20 to 30K. MR. 20 to 30K is enough that the quant qu the, the quants in the room can at least sink their teeth into the data and pretend that they can extrapolate. Eight's just, it's too early, Got right? It. It's just too early. All right. right. Andrew, hope that helps. Uh, great question. Uh, let's move on here to Paul. Um, how difficult was it for you to negotiate the EchoSign acquisition by Adobe? Did they come chasing after you or were you looking for a buyer? And I, I don't know how much you can talk about this, but. Uh, well, I'm out. So I can talk, <laughs> I can, but how, many, how much time do we have, an hour uh, left? Uh, yeah. 20 minutes. 20 you'll be, and you'll be my psychiatrist? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of higher level questions about M&A, right? So, so let me try and, it, it was definitely, a, it was a very painful and tough process, but that was way back in 2011, right? And we were just coming okay. out of the 
the <laughs> disaster of yeah. Lehman Brothers. And in fact, their M&A machine, they hadn't done an acquisition since Omniture. So it was rusty. Like, and that was a big, big one. So that we walk into swallow. the integration room. There's like 50 people, 60 people at my company. They have 80 people in the integration room. And they have like these manuals that are like a foot tall that they wow. did. They blow the Omniture dust off. <laughs> and they tell me, the CIO says to me, I need three to four of your IT guys to do a Salesforce migration. I said, I'm a SaaS company. I, don't I got have any it. IT I don't know, like we're, we're speaking French and, yeah, French yeah. and English here, yeah, right? So, yeah. so, and they've gotten better since then, I know, from, from other founders. So it was a rough, a rough process. Um, um, but it was a long time ago in internet time. The, the real question is, how do you get a decent exit? Yeah, we had, we had, a, we had another uh, term sheet, another suitor on the offer. And the simple answer is, Adobe got wind of it, and instead of taking six months to make a decision, um, you know, get, got us term sheet in three days, right? But the real, so the learning from that is classic multiple, multiple, and in this case it was true, it wasn't faked, right? The real reason you hire an investment banker is to get you fake other offers, yes, right? It always yes. works, right? And Different topics. did you, so but were you me, already talking to Adobe? But here's no? the interesting part, so we weren't. Okay. There was another transaction that was pretty, pretty far down the path that was a very different transaction. Which, which, who knows whether that was a good idea. But they got wind of it and, and, and they outbid the, the, the initial transaction. But the learning from it is that was a relationship that stretched back to 2006, right? It stretched back years. And so, you know, uh, I, you know selling, selling's a tough thing, right? I sold my first company after 12 and a half months. It was the toughest 12 and a half months of my life, but whatever, it's 12 and a half months, right? Yeah. Five years, it's like selling your child, yep. right? So. But, but if you do want to have optionality, you do want the ability to sell, build these relationships. Just, just build them. And right? were, they, were they a customer already? or what Partner, was relationship, but just people, once you're, once you're pre-hot or hot, they'll reach out to you. You don't actually have to, like, you, go, you can go reach out to them. But, you know, when, if you're in, like, TechCrunch every week, eventually, or whatever it is, I mean, you eventually, you know, there's people whose jobs in their corner offices to keep track of the 10 or 20 interesting companies. In this. So they'll, they'll find you, take the meeting, and be respectful, right? And realize it may be a waste of your time, but you don't know where it's going to go. Got it. Right? And so the time comes that you can, you can, if you need to dust off those relationships or create them, they, they, you don't have to try and, you can't invent a relationship overnight, right? right? Well, and I think the same is true with investing, right? I, I always tell people, like, get to know the VCs who matter in your space early. Yeah. E e don't even tell them you're raising money. Like, just go out and meet them and, and get, th get their feedback. And then, you know, come back six months later and you've made some progress and they're like, wow, these guys, that's what they said they were going to do. They, it looks like they're executing, you know. Um, I, I think the biggest yep. problem founders have, or one of the biggest problems, is they, they view this very transactionally. Like, I call Jason and Jason gives me money. Yeah. And it's like, no, Jason gives you money because he met you a year ago and, and he liked you and you kept in touch and, you, you know, you keep going. I mean, sometimes it happens first meeting but many many times it's you know a history that you've developed together it, it is it is true and so I've, I've thought a lot about that over my 18 months as a as a VC partner and that's great advice like it's it's the best advice in the world the challenge is whether it's because I'm a first-time founder or because of transactional or whatever it is um, people often don't they don't execute on that advice or frankly sometimes they reach out but it's too early yeah. Like, the, the, let's be honest, the, the, the busier the VC is and possibly more successful or pseudo successful, the harder mm -hmm. it is. Yep. And a lot of VCs don't take coffee. It's just come back. Like, in fact, they say, come to me when you're ready. Right. And I will say I, I, I take coffees, but I take coffees because they're interesting, not, yeah. bec not only because I'm like intellectually interested. Yeah. And I've done investments where I knew them for a while. And but I've also done investments where I just met them. But then it has to pass the 20 minute test. That's the thing. Like I have to know in twenty. If I don't know in twenty minutes, yep. then right. So if you if you're not a twenty minuter, then definitely build the <laughs> build the relationships, right? Got it. Well, and and I think in your case, the Equisign acquisition, you know, it's it's perfect case of that saying, you know, companies are bought, they are not sold, right? Like like Adobe, you knew them already, yes, and they caught wind of it, and next thing you know, you know they're coming after you. And th those are, if, if you're in trouble and you're out like shopping your deal around, yeah. uh, you know they can smell the blood in the water, and it, it just makes you less attractive, right? So I've um, never, I'm sure it's happened many times in your experience, but I've never seen shopping the desperate company ever work even once. I, right? I've seen it work, but it's it's ugly. But it, but yeah, but yeah, you've got to fake it somehow or yeah, do something, yeah. right? It, it's it's tough, right? Yep, that's there's an art to that. Um, so Paul, uh, hope hope that uh, that helps, and um, let's keep going here. We've got another one. Uh, from Ask Me Anything, okay, I don't know what that is. Uh, 
who are some people you respect and who understand consumer startups really well who can help us get from users to product market fit so I don't know if you I gotta take a pass on that one yeah, so I, I, I could sort of say but but I only want to speak about my domain expertise so I talk about okay. consumer folks I'm just attracted to celebrities all right <laughs> as we all are Beyonce, right? yeah. uh, or whatever it is just just celebrity celebrity investors well, and entrepreneurs, I'll, right? I'll just take a, a quick crack I mean yeah. it, it really it really depends on um, what subject we're talking about like are you talking about investors it, it doesn't doesn't really say much here but um, you know I, I, I find that social media is a great place to um, to find those sorts of people uh, uh, you know Heaton Shaw is a, a great example who does a lot of tweeting and blogging and writing about stuff who I know advises a bunch of companies um, it, it depends you know again what what sorts of things you're looking to do so I would go on social media Start to engage with people on social media, and um, and you know maybe you'll find some some great people there. On the investing side, there there are tons of great VCs who focus on consumer products, at at Sequoia and Excel, at Benchmark, you know, all, all Andreessen Horowitz, all over the place. Um, so I'm, I'm sure um, you know it's it's pretty easy to figure out who those people are if you're looking for investment. But um, uh, hope that helps, uh, Mr. Anonymous. Um, let's. Uh, Let's keep going here. Um, this one's from Terry. What are the most important attributes you look for when you decide to invest in a company? Got it. So, well, so I'm different, right? Because I only want to, I'm, I'm, I only want to invest in things that I think I understand. I just want to do so. I don't want to learn anything new. I don't want to do games. I don't want to do like the, the B2C thing. I don't want to invest in the next WhatsApp as the, like the greatest venture act of all time but, I just, but a lot of vcs are like that so it's not they, they are right but i'm I, so so anyhow so so i've learned i so if you're curious about me and so i'm a little I'm, everyone's the same but i'm a little bit different so i've boiled it down to just two and a half criteria that's all i look for it's it's just that simple and the first one only guys like you and i can do uh the other vcs without an operation they haven't been ceos they don't understand it so criteria number one are you a better ceo than me hmm. i say this to institutional vcs they look at me like like you're an, like you're an idiot. Like what do you mean? But when I talk to other founders, like I get it, right? Yep. I like I get who who's I'm good. Don't you know who the CEO? I'm, but 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 whatever that you know that David Sachs, he's better than me, right? So if you're not, I made one investment, only one in a CEO that that's worse than me. My worst investment. Hmm. Okay. Second criteria, and that 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 you know people that I can't prove to my partners, but I know it just like. You can just about, tell. About 90 seconds, but worst case, five minutes, right? Um, and um, second one is, this is a learning. This is just me, and other VCs will see it differently. I'm looking for better unit economics than I had. So what I learned is you can build a company like an Echo Sign or a box at a certain average price point. But if the price point's higher for the exact same amount of work, and I'm being simplistic, you can just get there faster, hmm. right? And so when I look at, Hyper growth companies that I've invested in, like a talk desk going from one to 12 in 12 months. Amazing CEO, amazing team. But their ARPU is like 70 bucks a month. Okay, I got 15. I see. So, not that Tiago isn't a better CEO than me, and Christina is the president, and Gotti is CEO, but also for the same amount of work, and I put same in quotes, right? For me, for 15, for them, 70, they can get there five times faster, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I'm looking for better unit economics, or at least I'm looking not for ceilings in unit economics. So when I meet companies that have great metrics, great CEOs, but there's no way that this product will ever be more than $3,000 a year, right? For, for a whole group, for like a whole company. Like I see this with SMBs, like I just pass. And, and other VCs will be like, I like the number. I like that you're doing really well, but I know it's too, it's just too hard to get up the mountain, right? So better unit economics than me, hmm. better CEO, and then point it in a vaguely good direction. That's it. And I, you what, know, what do you mean by that? A vaguely good direction. You, like, you either have to be in a space that's at least hot, or I can help you. I can help you make it sound hot, right? Okay. I, you know, search as a service wasn't that hot. Now it's a hot space. I invested a couple months ago in an amazing company that's next generation e-discovery. Okay, um, and so e-discovery it's actually kind of boring for people that are online, but this is e-discovery in the age of Slack um, and Dropbox. It's kind of interesting. Okay. So I need to know. Because if you're totally boring and uninteresting, it just means that you have to get even more revenue. Because <laughs> you have to prove all the haters wrong, right? But if you're like TalkDesk and it's like Zendesk for voice, like you already get it. You don't even know what Zendesk does, but it IPO'd last year and TalkDesk is Zendesk for voice. Like it's, so I'm, being, I'm using that as a simplest example. But, but I like if you're at least pointed in a good direction. Yep. And then frankly, I, I don't even need to see a demo. 
Wow. If you're better than me and you have better unit economics, I need to see a demo later, but I don't, even in the pitch, like I don't, don't, don't show, I don't need the slides, I don't need the demo. That's right? awesome. I, I that's great, uh, great set of Because we know who's there. better than us, don't we? Uh, usually, yeah. yeah well, we it's know. usually everyone, so, no, you know. No, no. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm pretty self-aware. I consider myself like Magna Plus, right? But the difference between Magna Plus and Summa Cum Laude, <laughs> it's not one grade, yeah, right? It's yeah. like an order of magnitude, isn't yeah. it? You just go, wow. <laughs> it's like, wow, like, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, and especially if you've been a manager, you know that one great, like, like that VP of engineering, that VP, like it's just like, it's the 10X, right? It's true with founders too, right? All right, well that's that's awesome. Uh, Terry, I hope uh, hope that helps. I um, think we got time for one or two more here. Um, here. Here's a good one from Lucas. So what is your process for finding the right unicorns to invest in? Do you focus on high quality referrals, leads from your Saster site, other? So you and I were talking before the show a little bit about this, but, yeah. um, so how do you, how do you find these companies? Uh, it's a it's a it's a great question that lots of VCs take different approaches to. Yeah. So I've learned a lot in 18 months. So so let me boil it all down and then we back into answering the question. So what I learned is the average VC meets with like three to five hundred startups a year. And sometimes if you're young and aggressive and don't have older kids or whatever, you can even push it to a thousand. Right. I boil it down to a maximum of one per week of new companies. A meeting in person. Meeting in person. Yeah. Right. Now. I'm being a little simplistic. I will meet for, I will, if it's an amazing founder that's doing something cool that's not an investment opportunity, but I love it, I'll meet with them too. So there's, uh, I'm not saying I only have literally one meeting a week, yeah. but one investment opportunity. And really, it's maybe like 40 a year. And I, in the beginning, I met with all these companies, and I realized the ones that are good but not great are just a waste of your time as a VC, hmm. right? As an angel, maybe. But it, the flip side, if you're hunting for unicorns, you can't, unfortunately, unfortunately, you can't waste time on very good. Very good. I don't need a 100% chance you'll get to a, a billion dollars in value. I just need some shot, <laughs> just like a Greater 1% than zero. chance. But the, very, the problem with the very good founders is it's zero. And the other problem with the very rational founder, so um, I invested in a company, a young CEO, 29, maybe 30, not super young, but um, no money to his name, got and owns half the company, um, got an offer to buy the company for $80 million. So is nothing to his name. A, what's 50% of 80 million? It's a lot, even in this in the Silicon Valley, that's a that's a lot of friggin' money. That's a house in Palo Alto yeah, right and, there. And you can go to another one. Yeah. And 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 he said no, he said no at any price. He, he didn't counter. He said no at any price. So you kind of like, but but the great people, the normal people, they you gotta take that offer. That's not even what we call FU money. That's like two FU monies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's an FU money for me. After and tax. then an FU money yeah. for vacations and an FU money for the house at the Yosemite Club. I mean it's a small one at the Yosemite Club, right? I don't get to be like right near the chairlift, but <laughs> but it's a condo, but I can I can do it. And so um, uh, so you have to so the the, the thing is there's so many very good startups, right? There's like a bajillion pretty good startups. But how many, but that very good to great. So I, I, what I'm telling you if it's frustrating, right, is be crazier, be bigger, be more insane, hmm. right? Be, be stupid and dumb and crazy because otherwise I just can't take the meeting because hmm. I can't make any money. I want it, I'd love to invest in you, but I got to turn, here's the scary thing. I'm a partner only in a $180 million fund. That's not tiny. It's not a little seed fund, but it's a, I have to turn that into $1 billion. You collectively. Collectively. Right. If we own... 15% of each company, how much do I have to turn that into? Six, seven billion dollars. I mean, it's going to be diluted. Six yeah. or seven billion dollars in exits. That means even a unicorn isn't enough. Right? So you need like seven unicorns. If we own 15% of one unicorn, that's 150 million. That doesn't even get us to 1x. And I got to do 5x to really kill it, right? Or at least 3x yeah. to, for them to give us another check. So think about that that crazy, it's a scary hurdle, right? So a $100 million exit doesn't really do it for you. Even, no, it'd even be if amazing, because like, you need multiple. The good news for a $180 million fund is a $100 million exit is huge, right? And you collect a few of them and you're there, right? Yeah. For an Andreessen or an Excel, I don't even know if you get to bring it up at the Monday meeting, right? <laughs> They're like, great, great show next, yeah, right? Yeah. Who, who, Anyone else? Because you got a $3 billion fund, what is a hundred million? So it's material, right? right? Right. So, so, um, so I'm not gonna. But what I mean is, if it's not a, some chance you could return a hundred million, just some some chance. Like I'm not asking for much. I'm just asking for faith. Then, then, uh, then can't ta can't even take the meeting, right? No, that's great. Well, look, we're uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Well, goes by fast. Yep, good always. stuff. Thanks yeah. for all the time. No, thank you. Awesome Thanks for job. everyone in the cyberspace. Uh, yeah. So um, if you want, you can uh, follow Jason on Twitter. Uh, 
His personal handle is Jason LK. Uh, you can also follow Saster, S A A S T R, or at Storm Ventures, which is uh, his firm. Uh, tune in next week for another episode of Founderline. Our guest will be Jessica Livingston, who is a founding partner at Y Combinator, which is a seed stage investment fund uh, that's funded more than 800 startups, including some unicorns like uh, Dropbox, Airbnb, Stripe, and Reddit. Uh, it'll be a great show. Jessica is an amazing person, and uh, it, it'll be fun to uh, get her perspective. Uh, it's going to be at a special earlier time next week only. Uh, it's Wednesday at 4 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, thank you once again to our amazing sponsors, Auric, uh, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. You can email questions for Jessica in advance or tweet them. Uh, email address is help at founderline.com. Uh, also go to our website where you can sign up for weekly updates. You can read about upcoming shows. Uh, you can uh, watch some of our previous episodes, and you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Uh, thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next week.